Hello everyone, welcome to another video for the History Valley Podcast with your host, Jacob Bremen. Today I am joined by Edward Dodge, the author of the book called A History of the Goddess from the Ice Age to the Bible. And we're going to be talking about that book today. I have uh, several questions about it, because um, I know that in the ancient cultures, uh, um, the, uh, the goddess was often originally the could often either be the the, the co ruler with the father, or is even entirely the supreme deity uh, herself, um, depending on the cultures in the ancient world. So I was going to give a brief introduction, and then we'll get started. So um, as it says in the back of the book, um, Edward Dodge is a clean energy developer and writer from Washington D.C. with degrees from Cornell University. He studied the history of cannabis, which provided the origins of this book. All right, so let's get started. Um, so my first question for you is, is it your view, because it appears uh, from, from what I've read so far, uh, that Yahweh appears to have been the son of El and Asherah, and Asherah was the supreme lover goddess of pre-monotheistic uh, Israel at some point, and she kind of got tossed out of the... Uh, of the narrative and she she says go on so could you explain that process yeah absolutely so but the basic the way i see the history of uh, the whole story and the narrative is that as you said el and yahweh were, were two separate gods el mm -hmm. was the original the, the israelites are pagans before they become monotheists Every, all the scholars recognize this and the you know and the discerning reader can see this for themselves in the text um all right so El and Yahweh were two separate gods. The original Israelites were followers of El. Israel, El, 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 we Israel. El is the God of Israel. Um, and so El is, a, is the heavenly father. He's the father of all the gods, the creator of the universe. He stands above the divine council, but he is like distant and removed from human affairs. This is how the sky father generally is. He's like out in space. He doesn't deal with the, us lowly human beings. It's his children that are the gods that are actively involved with us. So his wife is Asherah. She's the mother goddess. Um, you know, by Sumerian traditions, they're both born for a primordial mother, um, you know, another generation back. So that would be Nama or Namu in the Sumerians or Gaia for the Greeks, who's the, the primeval virgin right. mother of everything, who gives birth to her own mate, who's, who's the first sky father. And, um, and then we go on from there. The kind of like with Uranus. Yes. Yeah. yeah I, in fact, I think Hesiod's Theogony provides a key to sort of the stages of growth of human religion over time, that I think we can actually trace this back in the art to the Ice Age when what we see are the Venus figurines for tens of thousands of years with no attendant male, which does not mean they didn't have a Sky Father because the Sky Father, as I think everyone would agree, is like ephemeral. You can't touch him or see him or he's right, out in space, yeah. right? So there's, it makes sense they wouldn't necessarily be make, making art of him. So I don't want to say there was no Sky Father, but clearly they've got a mother tradition of some sort. Um, exactly. And then as you get into the Neolithic, we don't see, so um, according to Hesiod, the next generation is like monsters, like the, the first generation of gods, like the Cyclops and monsters and things before we get to the Titans. And if you go back to the Neolithic, we see that kind of thing. In the artwork, we're seeing all, we don't see anthropomorphic gods. What we see is um, just different creatures and beasts, some of them that we recognize and some that we don't. Um, and it kind of corresponds to what Hesiod's talking about, about monsters. And then we get into the Bronze Age, and now we've got a recognizable pantheon of anthropomorphic gods. We see it both in the writing and in the art. So we've got the original Sumerian pantheon, where An is the name of the Heavenly Father, and Ninhursag is the name of the Earthly Mother. Um, Inanna is the original love goddess who was the most popular deity. She's the Queen of Heaven. Um, Enlil was the original King of the Gods. And then this pattern repeats itself. Enki was also an important god. But the pattern basically repeats itself about every culture comes along, replaces the king of the gods with their new king of the gods. Um, the love goddess goes on in every culture, but they just change her name. Um, and in the earlier stories, she has much more power. So this is, this is the key to my thesis, is that you can follow the traditions of Inanna, who becomes Ishtar of Babylon, who is now Astart in the Bible, who King Solomon worships, that she was the most popular deity in the Bronze Age. She's the daughter of the, uh, you know, the mother goddess. Um, 
And she's a goddess of love and war. So she's uh, these mother traditions, these women's traditions are led by women. They are, are they're, fertil they're called fertility religions. They are all about their farmers. These are Neolithic farmers. So they're, all their traditions are rooted in agriculture, the growth of plants and celebrating the plant growth and the turning of the seasons. And all these traditions that you see are all routed in these um, cycle of life traditions and the, the dying and rising God stories that repeat are all, every single one of them is a, is a turning of the seasons, cycle of life story. And they're led by women and so it's very sexual. They believe that sex makes the flowers grow, semen is rain. So they're having public sex. Um, they have temple prostitution. It's run by women. It's a women's institution. The women keep the money. The women have got the authority and they have a great deal of authority. They help to choose the kings, um, the sacred marriage ceremonies, the high-risk gamos um, is being done. Um, beginning, we see it with Inanna and Demuzi is the oldest version of this story. Um, Demuzi, so then I said Inanna becomes Ishtar. Demuzi becomes Tammuz, who's one of right. also one of the Israelite gods, who's one of the months of their calendar. So we know that Tammuz is part of these traditions. And he is the first shepherd king who comes in and wins the love of Inanna to become king. And she sanctifies him and makes him king. Um, but then as the traditions go on, as we go through time, we see the goddesses being reduced in rank steadily. Um, because over the course of the Bronze Age, the earlier cultures had all been egalitarian. Um, women had great rights. There's no signs of warfare or dominance. But as we get into the Bronze Age and as we get into civilization around 5,000 years ago, 5,500 years ago, um, the warrior kings take over. And we start to see um, permanent warfare, slavery, and civilization as we know it with like led by kings basically that are all there's all warrior kings. And so the men start to assert themselves over the women. And you can see in the, both in the mythology and in the progression of laws in Mesopotamia, because you know they write their laws on these big steles, like Hammurabi's laws. Hammurabi's laws are the famous, but they were neither the first nor the last. So right. you can see, and they talk about these sanctified women, the temple prostitutes, what they're doing. And you can see that they have great deal of rights early on, and that these rights get reduced, get reduced, get reduced over time. Then, you know, 2,000 years goes by, we hit the Bronze Age collapse, and it's a mat. You're familiar with this, right? The, mm -hmm. From 1,200 to 1,000 is a complete breakdown of civilization, a yep. catastrophe. And out of this emerges new cultures. The old forms of writing all break down. We get new forms of writing get invented. The Greek and, and Hebrew writing gets invented. Right. Um, and so uh, then you enter a stage in the first millennium where, like, the men are really finally taking power for real. Like finally, and so you see in the mythology, both in the Greeks and the Hebrews, where they're really pretty hostile to these women's traditions. Um, the Greeks don't eliminate them, but they do reorder them so that none of the goddesses, and the, Zeus is a new god like Yahweh, and they reorder the Olympian pantheon. And if you look in the Olympian goddesses, none of them challenge Zeus's authority. Because um, all these, the older generation of goddesses, like Ishtar is not subservient to any man. She's not monogamous. She is not married to the king of the gods. She is her own independent character. Um, she is uh, notoriously right. promiscuous. She's a warrior. She's a killer. Um, she's extremely powerful and extremely popular. And she's not subservient to any man. She does not serve the patriarchy, basically. These are the old goddesses of the old matriarchy. So as the patriarchy wants to assert itself finally, you know, you've got, I mean, when you think about it, you've got to get rid of these goddesses. The Ishtar is like a nightmare role model for you can you can see why they eliminate her because she's a character who is um she celebrate they celebrate her prostitution she's transgender transgender priests are part of the story they're they're all a feature in the in the goddess temples they love the transgenders um, Ishtar is transgendered um, but she challenges all the men in her life her one husband she sends him to hell um, she doesn't she disrespects the men she challenges her father for authority and, and succeeds she takes authority from her father. Um, and so these are not characters that they want their daughters learning about in mythology. They don't want to be telling bedtime stories about Ishtar to their young girls because they don't want their daughters becoming Kadesha prostitutes. The Kadesha is the name in the Bible for the temple priestesses who are the ritual prostitutes. And they explicitly make a law in Deuteronomy saying your daughters will not become Kadesha. It's a, you can explicitly see where they're stomping out these traditions and getting rid of them. And then but they don't ever explain them. They don't want you to know anything about them. Ultimately, they write a history of the world where there never was a goddess, where it's only been 
a male god back to the beginning of time, where it's only been patriarchal generations back to Adam and Eve, and we know nothing about um, any other way to live. Like, that is the history of the world that we get, and that's the history of the world that is taught, so we know of nothing else. Um, we don't know that actually history is much longer than 4,000, you know, because Abraham's young earth creation is 4,000 BC. Like, that's right. supposed to be the beginning of the world. Yeah. That's an odd date. You know, William Lane Craig made the point that that is, even by the standards of the day, would have been a very odd date to choose. Like, that's clearly not how old the world was. The towns that they were living in were much older than that. Um, the Sumerian town, the Mesopotamian cities are much older, and the cities in like Jericho specifically, the cities in, in the Palestine and Lebanon, these were Neolithic cities. They're 7,000 years old at that time. Jericho is 10,000 years old today. So they had to recognize that, that that date is serving a mythical purpose, not a scientific purpose. And I liken it back to when the, uh, when the shepherd kings first asserted themselves. Like that maybe is like the mythical date of Tammuz, for instance, um, just to sort of speculate. But like this is like where they can trace back their patriarchal generations and they just don't want to admit there's any other history aside from their patriarchal generations because that's all they care about. But these other women, these women-led traditions, they would have been maternal bloodlines, which is why you don't need to control for women's sex lives. You women can be, don't need to be monogamous if you're not tracking the seed. If you're only tracking the womb, it doesn't matter who the seed donor is. But the Greeks and the Hebrews make quite explicit that it's not the womb that matters, it's the seed that matters. And it's the father's seed that needs to be tracked, not the mother. And this is a cultural reform, it's a reformation on even bigger than the Catholic and Protestant Reformation. It was probably a bloody affair, and I think it lasted centuries. I think it's a culture war that takes centuries to, to play out. And it plays out over the entire First Temple period. Basically, they're fighting about this, the entire First Temple. When the First Temple gets burned down in 586, they're still pagans. That they've got these Yahwists who are a reformed community within the broader Israelite pagan world. They're reformers and they're not popular. They're like a minority sect that is deeply unpopular. Um, their reforms never stick. But then after everything is destroyed and they go into exile in Babylon, then they craft an entire new theology of monotheism. You know, under it takes them a while, it takes them like 150 years um, before they come back with the what is presumably the Torah um, under Ezra, um, which is when, you know, that's what tradition says that they you know, completed the writing of the Hebrew Bible was Ezra, and he brings it back from Babylon back to Jerusalem. Right. Um, and, then, and then what he does when he gets back to Jerusalem is he forces the men to divorce all of their Canaanite wives. And, then, and so I liken that to be the final act of the divorce, when they finally sever the final cords of these old traditions. And now, the, and now the male god is now the supreme god. And there's no goddess at all. The Hebrew yeah. language does not even have the word goddess. They don't even acknowledge the concept of the divine feminine. Which I think is amazing. So I think it's just that is a remarkable and amazing fact. Do you think that this same scenario plays out in Gnosticism when Sophia is understood as the mother of, uh, of Yaldabaoth? So basically... What exactly. Gnosticism is doing is kind of reversing the scenario. Like, okay, let's bring back the goddess. And Sophia turns into the mother of Yaldabaoth, whom is basically a, a different version of Yahweh. And Yahweh's predecessor is the monad. He's a higher, friendlier god. And in this scenario, what you're describing kind of reminds me of... Yeah, no, I think it's totally... Yeah. I, I'm totally with you. Um, yeah. I don't know all the stories in detail, but what I do know is this, that so... King Solomon is the father of the wisdom traditions. Um, right. And he's the one who first transmutes. I mean, maybe he gets it from older traditions, but as far as what we see in the literature, he's the one who starts talking about wisdom as she. And he mm -hmm. never calls her Sophia, but she gets the name Sophia later on. But he's the one, so you see this in Proverbs, where, you know, uh, wisdom crawls out, you know, she is, you know, more valuable than gold, all this stuff. I mean, it's great. Those are great, those are great passages. Um, right. And King Solomon, he's, he's <clears throat> excuse me. Okay. King Solomon, is, he's criticized for worshiping goddesses. He sits in a lion throne, which is totally um, symbolic of the goddesses. Um, he's got all this stuff that he's got all these wives. He loves the women. He's clearly like the women love him. Song of Songs <laughs> right. is also from these uh, liturgies of the sacred marriage um, that, that's part of a genre of poetry that goes back farther in time. And so 
all the evidence of his like goddess worship is still there. And then the biblical writers are like trying to explain it away and wish it wasn't true, but <laughs> they can't deny it because he's like so famous and so cool. Um, and he's like, you know, everybody's favorite character you know, in that era. He's like the most before Jesus comes along. He was, uh, you know, most important character in the, in the Old Testament, I, I would say. Or most popular anyway, in terms of like literature and more stories being told about him, that kind of thing. Right. So centuries go by. Um, you know, the feminine divine never completely goes away. It's always a cultural, it's always there in culture. So you just have, there's a, you know, religion is this one long conversation over time that is, you know, happening continuously in this back and forth as people debate about the nature of the universe and our purpose in life and all this stuff. And it's just this running conversation. And so the feminine is, is part of our human experience. I mean, it, 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 you can't really deny that it, that it's there. And like, you know, sex and drugs goes back to the, you know, forever. So it's like, it's not like people weren't doing this stuff. It never went away. Um, so, and, and, and so there's just this tradition and you can, you can trace it all the way through time. And like, that's what I did in my project was just to like, you can just put it all in the historical timeline and, and follow it all the way through history. And you can follow it all the way to, to, to today. Like and you can follow it to the middle ages when they're, so like the monotheistic, Patriarchal authorities are, are deeply hostile to any tradition that would bring you back to the idea of the mother, because that obviously shatters their entire theological worldview that it's a father alone. They can't allow for a mother. Um, but the Gnostics were obviously doing something different, and they were fully embracing the mother. They fully right. embraced Sophia. They said she's the wife of wife of Jesus. You probably know the stories better than I do, but I know that you know they talk about Sophia as the bride of Christ. Um, and the, and the monad and the and the, and the demiurge, I only just figured this out just recently. You probably figured this out before, but like that that corresponds to El and Yahweh. And they talk about Yahweh being a nasty imposter, and El was El was always regarded as the kind and compassionate. El is always considered a nice god, like in the right. Sumerian mythology and the Canaan mythology. He is he's generous. He's helpful. He's nice. Like he's not mean. But Yahweh is the one who's all the genocidal and jealous and wants to crush people and destroy things and all the stuff that's nasty in the old testament it's like i, I see that as all as yahweh and all the nice parts of god that that's l <laughs> and so right. I, i'm perfectly content with like all right i can believe in l and all <laughs> the stuff i don't like i toss that chalk it up to yahweh and say he's not my lord um there's an uh there's a there's a papyrus and uh elephantine uh, down there in egypt that um I read about a while back that says that Yahweh has a wife called Anat Yahu, and Anat the consort of uh, of Yahweh. Um, so Anat is the most fabulous and interesting character of all of these. Right. So there's really a, a triple goddess is this motif that repeats over time, mother maiden and death or mother maiden and crone, and we see this. Um, so three goddesses that can, in the most powerful versions, they all come together as one single thing. We see this in the Hindus. So the Shakti traditions of Hinduism, got, oh, got Parvati, Durga, and Kali that go with, with Shiva. So are you familiar with Kali? She's like the death goddess. Yeah, she's a Hindu she's, goddess, right. The Hindu goddess, yeah. Kali, she's like covered in blood and she's got a skull necklace and a belt of human hands. And she's, you know, the agent of like ultimate destruction. Are you familiar with Kali? Yeah, yeah. So Anat is the Israelite version of Kali. She, mm. That's how she's described. She's got a skull necklace, a belt of human hands. She's drenched in blood. She's a goddess of slaughter. And she's Baal's lover. She's Baal's sister. Um, and so if you read the Ugaritic texts. Yeah, that, that's yeah. where they talk about the kind of yeah, gods. So like the Baal, Baal cycle. So Baal cycle. is the one. She is the one who's most important to Baal. Um, mm -hmm. And she's got the most powerful capabilities. She yeah, doesn't she up, Doesn't she resurrect Baal from the dead after he gets he killed? He resurrects Baal. Well, get this. First... She goes up to El, her father, the creator of the universe, and she threatens to kill him. She threatens to smash his skull in, make his gray beard run red with gore. She's going to tear down his house with her mighty arms if she doesn't get what she wants. And how does El react to being threatened this way? He gives her what she wants. He totally <laughs> gives it to her. He doesn't challenge her. He doesn't get angry at her. He doesn't say, you know, how dare you? He doesn't defy her at all. He totally says, yes, you are. He doesn't seem bothered by it. He says, yes, no one's more terrible than you, my violent daughter. 
and he gives her what she wants. And she says, yes, you are very wise. Al. <laughs> and what he, what they want is a temple for Baal. So then they go build the temple for Baal. Um, they also go visit Asherah, who is, who is said to be shivering in her boots, qu quaking with fear when Anat and Baal arrives. And they said, what are you going to do? Are you going to kill me? Are you going to kill my sons? Are you going to kill my lions? Um, and they say, no, we want, we just want your approval to get a, a temple for Baal. And then she says, okay. Um, and she has to give her approval. El waits for Asherah's approval on these kinds of things. El waits for Asherah to pick who should be the new king, new lord. And El stamps it with his approval. So Asherah is respected. Um, but Anat is feared. And so then the story goes on. Baal gets too big for his britches and decides that he wants to challenge death. So they've got um, three gods. Baal, Yam, and Mot are the equivalent of Zeus, Poseidon, and Hades for the Greeks. Um, so you got Baal is, is like Zeus, he's the king. Yam is like Poseidon, he's the god of the sea. But Baal and Yam are rivals. Um, and then Mott is like Hades, he's the god mm -hmm. of the underworld, god of death. So Baal starts to fight with Mott. Um, the gods all decide that Baal is getting too, you know, he's getting out of line. Everybody has to submit to death, including the gods. And so they order Baal to, to submit to death. And so Baal reluctantly does has sex with a cow real quick on his way out of town, and then uh, um, and then dies. He gets killed by Mott. Um, Anat is so upset by Baal's death that she goes and finds Mott. She finds Hades. She grabs him by the collar and screams, give me back my brother. And then she pulls out a sword and cleaves him in half with a sword, grinds him up with a sieve, burns him with fire, and feeds him to the birds. Um, and with that, Baal is resurrected and restored to his throne of glory and that's their resurrection cycle is that anat is the one who goes around um destroying and resurrecting everything and she's the most powerful goddess anat is by far the most powerful character in the whole thing and right. the greeks don't have any goddess like that this is part of one of the things they do in reordering their traditions they eliminate that character like because that would be a character who is more powerful than zeus who who put zeus on the throne who destroys hades who threatens Kronos. I mean, there's just nobody like that. Right. Uh, there's no character that cuts Hades in half with a sword and feeds him to the birds. I mean, it's absurd. Um, so I just think she's really the most remarkable character. And she's Astart's best friend. They ride into battle together, riding on lions. She's this warrior maiden. And apparently she was quite popular. And like, um, so in the period at the end of the Bronze Age, Egypt was ruling Canaan. Um, for a few centuries and before that you had the Hyksos. So there was a lot of crossover between Canaan and Egypt. And so these gods were being syncretized between Egypt and Canaan for like 500 years. And so Anat and Asherah, they were worshiped in Egypt. Um, there's another goddess down there named Kadesh, who is right. who seems to be either the same as Asherah or either all three of them together possibly, um, like Shakti. But um, but yeah, so these goddesses are really popular. and. Um, and you know Ishtar was the queen of heaven, and and uh, and then you got Anat running around, who I just think is, I, I, I want to put these characters in graphic novels. That's what I want to do. That's my goal: is put these characters on uh, into a comic book or animation. I just think she'd be so badass. Cool. Uh, yeah, you gotta let, <laughs> I mean, you, gotta, you gotta let me know when you uh, get around to publishing them. Yeah. Well, if you know anyone that uh, is producing graphic novels, I'm trying to find somebody. Yeah, I'll let you know. Um, so, there's a there's a particular goddess um, in Egypt that what you're what you're talking about reminds me of this uh, goddess Sekhmet. Yeah, She's exactly. A, no, that's another triple goddess. Yeah. Um, Hathor, Bastet, and Sekhmet is another triple goddess. Yeah, um, doesn't Demeter. she doesn't she go around slaughtering a bunch of humans in a, some kind of? Yeah, she eats like a third of humanity. Right. Um, before she is finally uh, dissuaded, they get her drunk to like calm her down. Kali does the same kind of thing. Right. She like is an unquenchable rage. So basically Parvati, when she gets, Parvati is the mother goddess. She's the nice and kind and gentle, loving mm -hmm. mother goddess. But when she gets pissed off, she turns into Kali. And then she's unquenchable rage that will like destroy everything in her path. And the only thing that calms her down is Shiva. Basically got, Shiva's got to lie down on his back and wait for her to come and sit on his lingam. And then, uh, <laughs> then the universe can come right. back to. Yep. Um, yeah, and Shiva is the, he's the creator and destroyer God. 
sort of like how the, the father god often is portrayed too that like he can create or he might decide to destroy yeah i mean um, the hindus have got their own they got a trinity of gods and they come along a little bit later or maybe i guess in the axial age they're probably more contemporary with the hindus i mean the ring yeah. made is older but that doesn't have and don't they have a sky too. father called a uh, diaspita Perhaps, and then Indra, though I know, was the king of the gods. Right. The I'm, not, I'm not. I'm not super detailed on the on the Vedas, and they've got Soma, which is cannabis. Um, so we've got these traditions that, because I, that was my introduction. All this stuff was like studying this stuff, the the, the cannabis side, and recognizing because like I was looking at. So my entry point into this whole thing was looking at, and I'd love to talk to some scholars to be critical about this. Um, modern scholars will say that there's five references to cannabis in the original Hebrew, um, where the word canna, and then it gets mistranslated in the original Vulgate. And so you see it as either the plant calamus or the term aromatic cane, which doesn't really mean anything. That's what you see in English. Um, mm -hmm. But the most important reference is Exodus 30, 23, where it's an ingredient in Moses' holy anointing oil. And so, as I'm sure you're aware, the holy oil is very important. Right. It sanctifies all the objects in the temple, all the Ark of the Covenant, as well as the priests and kings, right down to Jesus Christ, who is the anointed one. Um, so the notion is, you know, if cannabis is in this oil, that's really bloody important, but it's obviously not in the traditions now. So I was just curious. I was just doing this on my own. I was like, all right, where in history does the tradition change? Like at some point they threw it out. It was there at one point, and then later on they got rid of it. So where can we see where that happened? And then it was in doing that research that I learned about Asherah, who I had never heard of. And I'd gone to church all growing up. Um, I went to Sunday school K through 12, and then I went to Catholic high school too. So like, I was pretty, I'm not, I was no biblical scholar, but I'd certainly spent plenty of time in church and plenty of time reading the Bible. And I'd never heard the name Asherah mentioned once. And the no, much less the notion that she was the wife of God. So I found that whole concept to be utterly baffling. And I wanted to know more. I was like, who is she? What happened to her? Um, and what did she represent? Like, what did you believe? If you were a follower of Asherah, what were you doing? What were you believing in? What was your worldview? Right. You know, and, and it has to be a worldview that is comparable to God. Like, she, at some level, it has to be complementary to God in some capacity because she's the wife of God. So what does that even mean theologically? I just felt that it was a very tantalizing question. And so then I figured, all right, so I had a theory. They got rid of her. So I bet you they got rid of her and the cannabis at the same time and these stories are all wrapped up. And that proves to be yeah. totally accurate. It's totally true. And cannabis is deeply sacred to these goddess traditions because it's not just uh, a drug, you know, it's a fiber, it's hemp fiber, which is incredibly important throughout all of human history because it's the longest and strongest fiber. So anything time you need the heavy duty jobs done, ropes, canvas, nets, bowstrings, bowstrings and shipbuilding in particular were traditionally made out of hemp. Um, ropes for corralling horses and riding horses it's all hemp um if you can get it because it's the most superior product and it was super common but on top of that the same plant is also a drug it's also midwifery medicine and it's a and the fiber gets used a lot in like bur ritual burials so the fiber has a very extensive documented ritual use especially in china um but there's hebrew traditions too of burying the dead and hemp shirts and that kind of thing um and so, and it's an aphrodisiac. So you got all these things that are wrapped together that for women, that the women do weaving, the women do plant drugs, the women make these potions, um, the women are the midwives, the women, you know, and it's the way, and the women run the sex tradition. So like, you can see why this plant, this particular plant, which was definitely there in the Middle East at the time, would have been sacred to these tradition, these women's traditions. And so then you can see why they would throw it out. Um, and it's not that they ban the plant the way they do in modern prohibition. They just get rid of the rituals that use the plant. You know, there's no concept of banning the plant. Yeah, when the when the goddess is gone out of Judaism, Yahweh not only takes the place of uh, basically takes over the role of her and all the other gods, but he even takes over the things that they did, like Baal. Baal slays uh, Tannen, the dragon, and Yahweh ends up being the slayer of the of the Le Leviathan. Um, they got Yahweh starts the flood, you know, Enlil starts the flood, Enki or Ea, depending on the version of the story, warns man about the flood. 
Um, and Yahweh does that too. Yeah, right? they he starts, he starts all these doing old, yeah, everything. They just take every, all these old motifs and, and rework them with around Yahweh. Right. Um, and that's how he develops from being some volcanic and or minor war god into this big super god and and then he turns into the only god and then exactly. whoever whoever stays in judaism turns into an angel so um that being said why do you think that ashura didn't stay at least as an angel well Broadly speaking, you got to remember that the Jews are always a minority people. I mean, they're a small group of people, and, but the world was still broadly pagan. Um, right. So these goddess traditions, they live right on. They, they didn't go away. The, in Baalbek, um, right. in Lebanon, which was like the centerpiece of the Canaanite religion um, with the big Chilthon stones. Are you familiar with that temple site? I'm not sure if I am or not. If I did, so I so Baalbek that. is a is a site that the Romans rebuilt. Baalbek, I heard, I know about. Yeah, and they call yes. it Heliopolis. Um, yeah. And the Romans built their biggest temples anywhere in, in the entire empire was built there at Heliopolis, and right. they were still using them right up until Constantine and the later emperors shut them down. So these these sites were really had a long long history because these are Neolithic locations. These people have been living there since the dawn of the Neolithic. Um, but the, that that particular temple site has these three big stones called the Trilithon. They're the three biggest stones that have ever been cut and moved by human beings in all of history. Right. They're like 900 tons a piece or something. They're outrageously huge. Um, but the Romans didn't do it. They were already there when the Romans built that site. So the site was already clearly very, very important because the Romans felt the need to make it grander than ever to like prove that their gods were bigger than the gods that were there earlier. <laughs> but the gods that were there earlier were clearly Baal and Astarte because they rebuild the sites as to Jupiter and Venus and then Bacchus, so Dionysus. Those are the temple sites for the Romans, but earlier than that, it was Baal and Astarte. Um, right. And they talk about, Eusebius specifically mentions that Constantine personally shuts down the temples of Venus at Heliopolis, where they were still doing all these sex rituals, and Eusebius is like, scathingly critical of like, you know, these votaries of men that are like, you know, bes besmirching their masculinity. I, I forget the quotes in my book, but, um, but he talks about, you know, that they're doing all this impure stuff. Um, and, he, and, he, and he totally praises Constantine for shutting it down. Well, that, that's the same temple site that has been in use for thousands and thousands and thousands of years. And right. It was like the centerpiece of the Canaanites at the time of these religious reformations are happening with the Israelites. Um, and the way Yahweh takes El's place kind of reminds me of, sort of reminds me of, uh, in the Hittite Anatolian myths, uh, Tishab, the storm god, whom uh, is supposed to be Ishkar, and, and uh, a, a Syriologist and people that translate the Hittite text know that Ishkar and Teshub share the same cuneiform signs. They appear to be the same god. And he overthrows Kumarva, whom appears to, to have been Enlil originally. And uh, he's gone. And Enlil, he reminds me a lot, of, a lot like El, sort of. Like even the name sounds a bit alike. And well, Enlil was definitely there alongside On. We know that. Right. And then when Marduk comes along, they don't like kill off Enlil. Enlil seem to sort of like stick around in the back and they don't like slaughter him. Right. Um, in, the, in, the, in the story, uh, in the poem of Damkini, I think it's called, they, uh, Marduk overthrows Enlil, captures him okay. in some sort of civil war with the, uh, with the Anunnaki and other group of gods. Right. The, Ash, the Ashnuna, if I'm pronouncing them right. That's, that's, that's the other group of gods. I'm not sure if I'm, mis I'm, not sure if I'm misremembering their names slightly. Um, and the, the rivalry kind of reminds me of the uh, the, the the rivalry between the, the divas and the asura and the Hindu text and the Danner and the Acer in the Norse text. Yeah, and, and I, my theory on this is that these all just represent actual cultural shifts. Like there's like one yeah. group of people with their god, and they're like actually going to war with this group of people with their god, and then whoever wins writes the mythology that says their god defeated the other guy's god. And like, right. and I think that that's just like what these stories are telling us that they are 
mythologizing historical events. And obviously, you know, we got to take it all with a grain of salt in terms of like reading history into it. But like, I do think you can say that with some safe, with some sureness that these represent every time there's a new set of gods and they talk about one of these gods overthrowing another god, that that is a story of one people group overthrowing another people group. Yeah. Yeah, basically. Um, let's see here. So, uh, in the, I know that the, the, the story of Yahweh displacing El in a way is sort of not completely. The difference, the difference between Yahweh and El is Yahweh doesn't doesn't like castrate his father. He doesn't defeat his father. He becomes his father. It's a little bit different. It's subtle, you know. But he Yahweh becomes El. They fuse them together. There's no conflict there. There's no conflict in Yahweh and El. The biblical right. writers want you want Yahweh and El to be the same God. It's, it's kind of like how in some Hindu text, Vishnu and Shiva literally merge into the same God. And, yes, uh, that's exactly what they're doing. Yeah. I mean, and so the Garden of Eden story, they call it Yahweh Elohim. They, they put it together as a, as a conjunction. Right. Um, and I think that story is written later. I think that story is totally aimed directly at the goddess traditions that Eve represents Asherah and the Kadesha priestesses, that the tree of knowledge represents these sacred plants. I say I argue that it's cannabis, but I, I just think it represents these plant traditions in general. Now that you um, bring up Eve, um, is, there's a Sumerian story, as I'm sure you are familiar with, Inki and Nanma. And they talk about, okay, so Inki. The Lady of the Rib, is that what you're going to do? Yeah, Ninti. Uh, like she's pulled up, when Inki gets sick, because he he ejaculated, uh, his, his his ejaculation was tossed into the into the garden because he, he was uh, violating his great granddaughter, Utu. Not to be confused with the sun god, Utu. And, um, Nenma removes the stuff from from the from Utu the goddess, and she tosses it into a garden, and it and it grows into plants. And in Inki decides to consume the plants, or at least some of them, some of it. Anyway, he gets sick, and he falls down to the ground. He's dying, and then and some animal appears before Inki. I think it was an animal, and Inki says, you "Gotta find Nenma." And he goes off finding Nenma. Nenma comes in there, or Ninerzak. And she heals Inky by pulling out his organs <laughs> and turning it into different healing deities. And one of them is Ninti, Lady of the Rib. Right. So do you think, I know you said Eve, you were compared to Eve to Ashura, but what about that? How do you think that factors so, in? So, yeah, I looked at that story too. I mean, obviously, you're seeing the same metaphor. I mean, the right. pulling of the rib is. There's clearly a, at least a literary trope, if nothing else. Um, yeah. I, I, I don't, I'm hesitant to read too much into the analogy aside from what I just said. Um, right. I do think that, um, I do think the Garden of Eden story is a little more aimed directly at their reforms of the moment. That like, because where I think the real, the real parallels is from Eve to Pandora in the Greeks, where they're both right. the first woman and they're both being labeled as the source of all men's troubles. Um, that, uh, you know, it's their way of saying, like, we got to not, don't listen to the women. They're just going to, like, get you in trouble, man. It's like, got to shut the women up because they're nothing but trouble. So that's where I think the real, that's, that, that's the real parallel, I think, with Eve. Um, and then just the symbolism that we don't, the serpent was one of these symbols of the goddesses. And, like, the, they had, they really did have snakes and they in the, in the temples and they bred snakes and the women handled snakes. And this was like a thing that they did. Um, and right. so then they turned the, sim, the serpent into something bad. The serpent was just good. For, it was fine for Moses, you know? So we know that the story had to been written later because the serpent was good at the time of Moses. It only gets turned into something bad, labeled as something bad later on. Um, so, and then the tree of knowledge, the garden in general. Um, yeah, I think all these things are just symbolic of, of Shutting down the Kadesha priestesses and this entire set of what are effectively mystery mystery religion. It's a, effectively a mystery religion, like Demeter, uh, parallel to whatever the Elzinian mysteries were. Uh, that, that's what I think it is. So and they, don't, um, and they don't like it. They want to, They want to get rid of it. Right. So basically. They wanted to strike all memory of this goddess out of Judaism so much so they weren't even willing to keep her in as an angel, as a female angel. She just had to completely go. 
Oh, she has to be, yeah, she's a right. foreign goddess. She's a no, they turn them into demons. Right. I mean, a, I mean, Astart, they call her Ashtoreth, and the ETH means shame. So it right. means shameful Astart. So, like, here we see the beginning of slut shaming. Um, and they just continually insult her. The Asherah pole is like a Native American totem pole, which is like a really, really ancient human tradition that goes back probably you know, deep into the Neolithic or deep into the Ice Age, you know, deep into the Paleolithic. Um, because the Native Americans brought it over, um, you know, prior to the prior to the end of the Ice Age when the land bridge was still there. So it's a really old tradition, and we see it all over Europe with the maypoles. I mean, carved wooden poles representing Earth Mother is like a super ancient human tradition, and they are explicitly cutting them down and burning them. Like we don't want any mother goddess worship. And then as we get into Christianity, all of these same cultural expressions, sexuality, being gay, being trans. Um, use of psychedelics, um, all of this stuff, you know, uh, ecstatic dance, all that kind of thing, all this stuff that was really common in these right. goddess temples have been persecuted for centuries. You know, and they, they deemed, it, and they deemed centuries, it satanic. Ages. What's that? And they deemed it satanic. Deemed it satanic, exactly. Right. But we still see it today. I mean, you can go, this was sort of the aha moment for me when I was trying to understand what was going on in these traditions. I realized that it was like a nightclub. That it was like me and my friends at a Grateful Dead concert. It's like they're all tripping out and dancing and trying to have sex, or at least trying to, you know. <laughs> and uh, um, and it's like a big party, and that it's all the same stuff that conservative, patriarchal religious folks tell us is bad today. They've, they've been condemning it. They condemn it today. They condemned it back then. And it's like the same pattern, same scenario, yeah. all the way through history. Or at least for the last 2,000 years, anyway, 1,500 yeah. years. And that, and that was why I decided to write the book, was because I felt like this stuff is relevant to today, like it's relevant to the culture wars now, like that these characters are relevant, that like this whole story of the wife of God, that there's actually a complementary theology that, um, because you know, like the Hindus, they have long since reconciled their notions of the divine with the Christian God. And so did the um, Native Americans. They always said that their sky father was the same thing as a Christian god. But you know, the Christians just didn't pay attention. The Christians didn't care what the Indians had to say. They weren't exploring that um, theology at all. Christians didn't give a shit the native, what the Native Americans had to say. But the natives did were in fact saying that. But, but that wasn't the limit of Native American Christians. They also have Mother Earth. I mean, that's where we get the term Mother Earth is from indigenous people, because that's not really a pagan term, that, that's an uh, indigenous people's term. Um, and me, so the natives have Earth Mother, Sky Father. Well, the Hindus have very elaborate traditions of the feminine divine and very, very thoroughly documented theologies of these goddesses going back to the Rig Veda, so way older than the Bible. The oh, Devi yeah. Sukta, the hymn to the goddess is like really, really old and really powerful and like really explicit theology of you know, I gave birth to the Sky Father. Um, I am the first one. Um, and so what I started to see was like, all right, if they can reconcile their visions of God, but they've also got Goddess, that means there's like more to the story of the Christian God. That like, there's actually, instead of stomping out all these traditions, we can recognize the sacredness in them, in the stuff that we're already doing as a culture, and, you know, restore these traditions. I think there's a lot more power in trying to like, I'm firmly of the opinion that humans need religion and that our old religions are failing, but new religions haven't arrived yet. And so we're in a really you know, very dangerous time socially that like uh, where things are very chaotic. Um, so I think there's a lot of power in restoring the sacredness of these old traditions. That's, a, that's an interesting way of analyzing it. Um, well, um, I think we can cut it there. What do you think? Um, Sure. Um, I'm a little curious. All right, so I got one more topic I want to sure. address with you, though. Um, I don't know if you got to my part in the book about the resurrection. It, that's I don't think I've got there. I don't think I've got Yeah, that's like volume three. It's later on the book. So I have a whole bit about the Gnostics and a theory on the resurrection, which I did not invent this theory. I'm just reporting it. But right. basically, it's, it's swoon theory, the idea that the women drugged Jesus on the cross to fake his death. Oh, I'm familiar. And then yeah. brought him down before he died. Um, and then I present, you know, theory, you know, this is like a literary trope. We got it in Romeo and Juliet, 
And the idea that drugs exist that can make you appear dead uh, is true both in science and in literature. Um, so then, and then the argument that it's a cannabis tincture that can do that because cannabis tinctures really can do that, can make you appear dead, knock you out without killing you. So uh, does that mean you think that's what happened? Uh, I think it's a fun theory. I'm not gonna like die on that hill or anything, but uh, I think it's certainly fun to think about. And I, and I go through the effort of like making the case that this tracks pretty closely to the gospels. I mean, as you know, Dr. You know, Richard Carey and all these folks talk about like that we can't take the gospels as anything more than literature. Well, here's something I'll throw in here, just, just real fast. Um, What's that? Sorry. No, no, you're good. I just, uh, I'm sorry if I came off as interrupting. I just wanted to throw this in there because you were talking about the idea that Christ survived the cross. Well, Suetonius, and I'm just tossing this in here. I, I don't really buy into this. I'm just throwing it in here. Um, Suetonius talks about the Jews being expelled from Rome, and according to a later historian, Paulus Erosius, this happened in the ninth year of Claudius, so that's about eighty fifty. Um, so they launched this revolt, something happens at the city of Rome, this angers Emperor Claudius, and he expelled the Jews from the city of Rome because they, they revolted at the instigation of Crestus. And later, there's this church father called Irenaeus, and he, he seems to think that, well, Jesus died, uh, he, he makes a mistake, but he says Jesus died during the reign of Claudius, but under the reign of the governor Pilate, procreator Pilate. And obviously Pilate is gone at AD 36. He's not, he didn't reign during the reign of Claudius. So there's obviously a mistake there, but it's, it's interesting to ponder like, okay, could this be knowledge that he survived the crucifixion or, or not? Take your pick, but it's interesting. It, I mean, my take on it is, and again, I'm not going to die on, on that 80s hill. Right, right. But my take on it is, I, I am inclined to believe there was a historical Jesus. Same here, opinion. I believe there was a historical Jesus. And, yeah. and my best take on that is because, and I do think something radical happened, and the best evidence for that is that we've got rival groups immediately following that are, that are not in agreement about them. That if it was completely made up, there would just be one group making it up. It wouldn't be like my, multiple rivals. So you've got the original disciples who remain as practicing Jews who ultimately get killed in AD 70 for the most part. Right. Um, who by tradition are led by Jesus' brother James. Now again, like all this stuff is disputed as far as the facts, but that's the tradition. Right. Um, then you've got the followers of Peter and Paul who become the Orthodox Church. And then you've got the Gnostics that are radically different, that are presumably led by Mary Magdalene. And we've got Simon Magus and some other historical figures. But Simon Magus and Mary Magdalene are at least from the Bible. Um, right. So we know that these characters were at least there by tradition. Um, and so, yeah, the Gnostics are, are radically different. We were talking about them before. They, they believe in the, in the mother. and and. Uh, but I like the notion, I guess, if I'm going to go for Jesus, I'm going to be on team Mary Magdalene, and I'm going to be on team uh, the women pulled off the biggest magic trick and tricked everybody. Um, I just think it's a fun narrative. That's all I can say. I mean, I'm not going to, I'm happy to debate with anybody. And I do think that the idea that he, that they drugged him and pulled him down off the cross before he died actually tracks pretty close to his scripture and is the most, um, it's actually rational. You can actually imagine that happen. Yeah, the gospel and he of Mark. died a month later. He didn't sound like he yeah. survived wounded. They say he ascended to heaven 40 days later. I take that to mean like he died for real. That's interesting. You know? Never thought about that. The gospel of Mark, I don't remember where it says this. Somewhere in there it says, Pilate was surprised. Yeah. That Pilate died. Yeah, they brought that, him down in a Jesus couple hours. So they, crucifixion quickly. took days and they brought right. him down after just a couple hours. And that's the key. And they had medicines ready. They had bandages ready. They had a place to take them. The tomb was like all ready to go. Like and that's a rich man's universe. tomb. Like the whole thing was a setup. Jesus keeps predicting that he's going to die and be raised. <laughs> uh, you know, he, he goes and intentionally pisses off the authorities. He knows he's going to get arrested and he waits. He could have fled into the night. He didn't have to wait in the Garden of Gethsemane to be arrested and, and killed. Why didn't he run away? Because it was all a plot. The whole thing was a plan. Um, and the women were the ones who knew Jesus' deepest secrets, not Peter. And Peter was deeply jealous of Mary Magdalene. Um, and so the women get rid of that in the New Testament, too. I talked about this with Dr. Robert Price. It says, you know, they, there's this whole narrative of the women being thrown out in the Old Testament. Well, then he, he says you can see it in the New Testament, too. That gives me an idea. Maybe well. at some point. I'll, I should get have you and Dr. Price appear together. 
I did an interview with Dr. Price on mine. It's the one I haven't done many videos, but it's the one I do have on mine. Uh, but I'd love to. I love him. Yeah. He's a great guy. I haven't talked to him. Well, let's do one anyway. All right. Yeah. No, I yeah. don't talk to him anytime for sure. Yeah. I. My, I don't know if you've seen my videos on the New Testament. I mean, yeah, I do agree to those. I've seen some of them. Yeah, I, I do agree to the story with Dr. Carrier. Yeah, um, I do agree that there was a story which is not dispute that. And I, I think one of the things I, well, that's not that I think, like really, uh, one of the things I disagree with primarily if, on uh, with New Testament scholarship is the dating. I think the dating of the New Testament isn't quite as concrete as it appears. But other than that, I mean, I'm totally fine with the historical Jesus. I still think Paul wrote seven authentic letters. I just think he probably wrote them later in his life. That's about it, really. And then it's not too different, but that's just How about the idea. historicity of James, brother of Jesus? This is a strange text that always bothered me when I've, ever since I found out about it. Like, it's written in the mid-second century, maybe earlier. You had the second apocalypse of James, and it says something that's, that rings as a little more historical than the way earlier Christians portray James. Because like, James the Just, who was killed by Ananias, is the second apocalypse that James says, it was the death of James that caused the war. It's, it sounds a bit like Hegesippus. Like Hegesippus was saying the same thing. The death of James caused the war, destruction of Jerusalem. And Origen seems to think that his copy of Josephus says the same thing. If Josephus did say that, then obviously Pamphilus or Eusebius, who slightly modified Josephus, probably expunged it from the text. Anyway, it says he's the son of Judas at the very beginning of the, of the, of the second prophet of James. The Judas who was who is, who is the son of Judas? It says that James is the son of Judas, the guy that got beheaded by the Romans in oh, AD 46. I don't know who that is. Judas was a, you know, he's a rebel. He got killed, beheaded by Cuspius Fadus when he tried the Jordan River revolt. But the second prophet of James says James is his son. Literally. So um, maybe he's not the brother of Jesus? Is that the implication? Yeah, um, I mean, if they are related, they're probably related in a different way, uh, because Jesus, that would mean Jesus, that would mean James is later in in the chronology of that. If we're going to be the son of the guy who got killed in the forties, uh, yeah. yeah, I can't. I'm not enough of a scholar and all that stuff, the finer points and all that. But uh, I, I, I think it's probably correct. Other than that, I mean, it the James in the forties that was crucified by Tiberius Alexander around forty seven, probably. Could have been the real James of his brother, but anyway, that's just me pondering. Uh, for, uh, but I do think there's some evidence to that points to those possibilities probably being the case. But anyway, um, but yeah, what you were saying earlier about the swoon hypothesis is very interesting, and I think eventually we should do another show talking about Christianity. Like we get in, dig into that topic much more. Uh, I, I find it surprising that people dismiss the swoon theory so uh, readily. I've noticed um, that. I, 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 I find it actually, I, I, I always struck me weird because I think the swoon theory is by far the most explainable. And it's what the Muslims think too. I mean, you know, Jesus, it's not only the Christians that talk about Jesus, the Muslims talk about him too. But don't the Muslims thing. think that Jesus wasn't even crucified to begin with? Well, so in the Quran, they don't offer an explicit what they think happens. They don't, they don't right. say, they just say okay. either... Um, either he survived or somebody else was substituted or just something happened. They don't offer an explanation. They just say that whatever the Christians say is not right. Um, and then there's sort of an, then there's like an expression that says, if you saw a man crucified and then you saw him alive a couple of days later, doesn't that simply mean that he just never died? Yeah, it, it, it is an interesting natural explanation for the story. I mean, I admit that it does. It does explain that pretty well um but yeah i think he was certainly definitely dead by the time paul was writing uh whenever he was writing those letters in the first century oh yeah jesus clearly i mean well i mean the muslims right. also think jesus lived on in india so who knows <laughs> yeah i don't i i think the yeah i don't really buy the india story i mean there's 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 other, there's other, there's other stories about him going all the way to britain or whatever yeah those uh, are just no and and the Britain, the British version one is very, very late, though. And there's a, an Arthurian legend. They have this mythical story about um, Jose, uh, Josephus of Arimathea. Interesting name there. But literally, that's how it says it. He's the son of Joseph of Arimathea. And he ends up in These guys Britain. need a little more originality in their names. You know, it really is trouble for 
later yeah. historians to keep it all straight, you know? Yeah. I, I'm pretty sure it was his son that was said to have gone to Britain. Uh, but, uh, yeah. So, so Joseph Arimathea Jr. ends up in Britain and he, and he, del- and, he del- and he puts the grail there. Something like that from what I can remember. He puts the grail in Britain. It's obviously his myth, but it's, it's, it's an interesting, it's an interesting piece of fiction from a thousand years ago. Uh, and now there are some, there are some people that try to really stretch it and say, oh, there's more to Arthurian legend. It, in this case, it's probably, they, they try to, they try to force that to be historical somehow. I'm like, no, I don't think there's any tangible way that somebody could make a case for that. This doesn't make any sense to me. For a historical King Arthur? Yeah, I haven't seen a case for a historical King Well, I'm, I'm not necessarily that, but I was talking about them trying to like use Arthurian legend as a source for the historical Jesus. Some people try to do that. Oh, like, no, that sounds like a real stretch. Yeah, yeah people say all sorts of weird stuff. Um, they do. But, uh, but the real Ark of the Covenant, that's in Ethiopia. Mm-hmm. <laughs> well, um, you want to stop here? Yeah, I mean, it's probably an hour. Hour is pretty, it's a pretty good time not yeah. to make these things too long. So, But I'm happy to do it again. Um, sure. I'm happy to come on. I'm not really trying to do my own videos right now, so I'm happy to come on other people's channels. And I'm happy to talk to you any time, and especially if we got other people. More the merrier. Um, I'm, I'm actually really... I stamp... I stand by my case that I'm making that there's been a, like a tradition of the divine mother all the way through and that it gets stomped out and I'm not claiming my scholarship is, you know, no errors, but I'm definitely willing to make my case with anyone. Um, so I'm happy to take this argument literally to anyone. Um, so if you got scholars, I'm happy to talk to them. Yeah. Let's definitely do some more videos. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you for joining me, uh, uh, Edward Dodge and, uh, Thanks, thank you to the viewers for watching this video. Please don't forget to like, subscribe, and share this video. Get it out there. Comment. If any of you have any questions, throw it in the comments. I'll do the best I can to answer them as soon as I can. Um, and check out the links in the description. Like, uh, check out Patreon, PayPal. If any of you want to support the channel financially, you can do that. Or and or um, donate through super chats and future live streams and or future premieres. Thank you. Thanks, Jacob. Really appreciate it. Yep. It was a great time. Hello, viewers. Thanks for watching this video from the History Valley YouTube channel. Please don't forget to subscribe and hit the notification bell. And if any of you wish to further support this channel, please consider checking out this channel's Patreon page and becoming a patron. And or donate through PayPal or through Super Chat during a live stream. Thank you.